Good evening. And uh, for those of you who are not from the campus, welcome to McAllister College. Those of you who are from the campus, uh, welcome to the John B. Davis Lecture Hall for this presentation by Anurata Mittal from uh, Food First. My name is Brett Smith, and I'm acting director of the Environmental Studies Program here at McAllister. And uh, one of the most fun and challenging parts of my job is to teach a course every year called Sustainable Development and the Global Future. <laughs> Some of my students might be here tonight. In fact, they, they better be. Um, and, and as I've taught this course over the years and my thinking has kind of evolved on sustainability, I've really come to the conclusion that food-related issues, how we grow it, how we process it, how we ship it, how we distribute it, how we eat it, um, are absolutely central to issues of sustainability. Uh, I can't resist. As many of you know, the most commonly accepted definition of sustainability, which some of you out there should know, is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And I think it's widely acknowledged that in the area of food, we're not doing very well on either front. In terms of meeting current needs, we have hundreds of millions of people who are hungry around the globe, and even in a country as rich as, as the United States, we have hungry people. In terms of meeting the needs of the future, we are growing what we eat now in ways which um, deplete water, mine soil, reduce biodiversity. Uh, the problems that are associated with food and agriculture are widely acknowledged, but the solutions are controversial. But as I was considering uh, my programming opportunities for environmental studies, um, one of the first uh, groups that jumped into my mind was Food First. And so I'm, I'm very pleased and proud to have uh, Anurata Mittal with us tonight. Most of you are too young to remember the publication of the book Diet for a Small Planet. But it was published in, I believe, 1971, at a time when we were uh, becoming newly aware of the smallness of our globe and the interrelationships uh, among peoples, among environments, among ecosystems. And the idea that a diet could be shaped in the, in the support of this small planet was uh, a, an outstanding, powerful idea that grabbed a lot of people and sold a lot of books. Um, it, it launched a lot of ideas and perhaps very importantly, it launched uh, Food First, which is also known as the Institute for Food and Development Policy. So uh, I welcome you tonight. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the International Studies Department here at McAllister. And I especially want to uh, thank the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Uh, from right here in Minneapolis, uh, that is an, another one of the leading uh, international groups on food policy and improving uh, food processes, policies, programs around the world. We are lucky to have this, uh, this group in, in the U.S. and in, in Minnesota and in Minneapolis. And uh, tonight we, we have with us Kristen Dawkins from IATP, who's Vice President of International Programs there and an analyst and author in her own right. And she's agreed tonight. She travels around the world in support of of better food policy, and she's agreed tonight to introduce Anurata because they've run into each other uh, at various points in the globe. So um, again, thank you for coming, and without any further words from me, I'll turn the podium over to Kristen Dawkins from IETP. Hello, everyone. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. I only get about one minute tonight, but I love to give talks. And actually, the reason that I know Anurata is that from time to time, we find ourselves on the same podium together, or we even have been asked to pitch hit for each other when one or the other of us couldn't make an invitation. I've sometimes suggested to people that they call her instead. Our organizations, the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy and Food First, our sister organizations, we work on many of the same issues, and our commitment is uh, very, very strong towards justice in the world, starting with food issues, as Brett has indicated, but also trade policy, poverty issues, development in the third world, and uh, justice for all is really the bottom line. 
Hanumat is a wonderful person, a, uh, a uh, straight from the heart kind of talker. She's uh, also sharp as a tack, one of the most articulate people I think in the country, maybe even in the world. And uh, you're very fortunate to hear her tonight. Uh, she's a real expert on the whole issue of globalization and its many ills, as well as on the alternative vision for how we could shift what we presently have as the globalization horror story towards a uh, potential future in which justice and health can all prevail. Uh, she's not just a thinker and speaker and writer, however. She's also out there on the front lines. At all of these different uh, negotiations with the United Nations or the World Trade Organization, she's also part of the protest movements after she's giving her official statement inside to the governments. She comes right out on the streets and is on the front lines in the Doha uh, negotiations of the World Trade Organization. For example, she was one of the people with duct tape. Remember the era of duct tape protests? And uh, in the Cancun negotiations for the WTO, which were just this past December, she was part of the crowd that actually went inside the negotiations, which are usually very serious and diplomatic, and was part of the protesters there who said, shame, 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 and built up the loud chant, shame, shame, shame. She is uh, tonight going to be talking about food sovereignty and the new face of global agriculture. She has been a political scientist trained in India and in England. India is her home country. She's been here in this country for uh, a good decade or more and uh, involved with the Food First organization for uh, the past eight years. She is also part of the Right Livelihood Awards Jury Committee. This is sometimes called the Alternative Nobel Prize, which really gives an honor of that global significance to alternative people. Uh, and uh, it's gotten as much recognition as the Nobel Prize in some of the media. So she's one of the people that they have identified as uh, out there able to identify those alternative uh, experts and, and uh, change makers in the world community. So uh, Anurata, thank you very much for coming to Minnesota and thank you very much for all the fighting that you do on behalf of justice and the whole planet. Anurata Mittal. Thank you, Kristen. That was one of the most warm, beautiful introductions I've ever received. Um, it is such an honor to be introduced by Kristen, um, a fellow activist, sister in the struggle, and also an inspirational leader. And I don't know if I've ever said this to you before, but people like you and Mark have deeply inspired me, especially work that I've done in this country, in the United States. And I want to thank uh, all the sponsors who have brought me here, and want to thank all of you for being here. Um, yeah, it's just such a pleasure. I've never come to Minneapolis before, and I was expecting it to be really cold. But at least inside this room, the warmth of all of you, and especially Kristen, yours, I can feel it. So thank you. Um, so as uh, Kristen has mentioned, um, I'm going to talk about, um, I wanted it to be about hope today. I wanted to talk about the new face of agriculture. and. Um, and it might seem too simplistic from where I'm going to begin, but I'm going to begin from how agriculture was introduced to me by my mother. And um, from what I had learned from her, which is in the tradition in my culture, parents, mothers telling stories, the story that I always heard from her was that of for thousands of years, how small farmers have grown food for the local communities, planting diverse crops in healthy soil, recycling organic matter, following nature's rainfall patterns, maintaining the rich biodiversity. And this agricultural system was built on the accumulated knowledge of farmers of the local environment, which was passed on from one generation to another. And as we all know, or are already aware of it, that this farm system is facing not just an environmental, but a moral crisis. The family farm system, men, women, and children who have tirelessly worked to sustain it, on one hand have been romanticized by the poets, by movies around the world. And at the same time, 
They've been abused economically, socially, politically by policies such as industrial, promoting industrial agriculture or free trade agreements. And as a result, what we've been given is what's called modern agriculture. This modern industrial agriculture has replaced family farms with corporate farms, farmers with machines, mixed crops with monocultures, and has traded local food security with global commerce and food. I think this best uh, phenomenon is uh, best described by Wendell Berry in his uh, chapter in Fatal Harvest. He says, one of the primary results and one of the primary needs of industrialism is the separation of people, places, and products from the histories. To the extent that we participate in the industrial economy, we do not know the histories of our families, our habitats, or our meals. This is an economy and, in fact, a culture of the one-night stand. I had a good time, says the industrial lover, but don't ask me my last name. The industrial eater says to the swelt industrial hog, we'll be together at breakfast. I don't want to see you before then, and I won't care to remember you afterwards. United States is no different. U.S. farmers have been sold out to corporate agribusiness with ever-increasing numbers of farm bankruptcies and foreclosures, reaping a grim harvest of increasing alcoholism, increasing rates of shame and depression, suicides, and loss of rural community. In the 1930s, 25% of the U.S. population lived on the nation's 6 million farms. Today, America's 2 million farms are home to less than 2% of the population. Small family farms have been replaced by the large commercial farms, with 8% of farms accounting for more than 72% of all sales. Between 94 and 96, 25% of all U.S. hog farmers, 10% of all grain farmers, 10% of dairy farmers, they went out of business. The U.S. Department of Labor projects that the largest job loss among all occupations between 98 and 2008 will take place in agriculture and it is not surprising given that average farm operator household earns about 14 percent of its income from farming. The rest comes from getting a second or a third job at a local Walmart or a local gas station. And these figures they pale in comparison to one fact that the number one cause of death for farmers in the United States is suicide something that the media does not report. It does not report when President Bush talks about free trade agreements are really good for the American farmers, that out of 50 poorest rural counties, 49 of them are rural counties, that the average age of farmer in the United States today is 55 years or older, that there are more prisoners, that there are more people behind bars in this country than actually farmers left. It has been the federal policies which have really supported and greased this path of decline of the American countryside. For example, the Farm Bill, the American Farm Bill uh, of uh, uh, just two years ago, um, 2002, the crop subsidies there, they do not go to farmers who resemble John Steinbeck's Jode family, but they go to wealthy American corporations such as uh, Chevron, John Hancock Insurance Company. They go to wealthy individuals like Time Warner, entertainment executive Ted Turner, or David Rockefeller of Chase Manhattan Bank. Most family farms get nothing but a farm bill. And this subsidizing of well-heeled agribusiness has ensured the continued exodus of family farmers from the land. And the farm bill subsidies are basically taxpayers' money, which helps bankroll the nation's largest farmers, helping them to buy up the struggling neighboring farms and creating what's called a plantation effect which turns family farmers into sharecroppers. So farmers have lost control of the food as it's going through the chain. In 2001, the largest four pork uh, packer corporations controlled 62% of the market. Four poultry firms controlled 53% of the market, while the top four firms in beef controlled 81% of the market. And when you look at grain distribution, it is even more concentrated. Two companies, Cargill and Continental, they control about two-thirds of the grain in the world in 2001. Now this modern agriculture has not just robbed the U.S. family farmers, but it is robbing the world's poor. 
Using the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the international trade agreements, U.S. is opening up foreign markets for its agribusiness corporations. Today, one in four acres in America is grown for exports. And they do that by forcing poor countries to remove subsidies to lower tariffs. And then U.S. can export, for example, corn at 20% below the cost of production. Wheat at 46% below the cost of production. So the result is basically a reverse Robin Hood in effect, basically robbing the world's poor to enrich American agribusiness. In 1997, over 2,000 farmers committed suicide in Anantpur, a district in Andhra Pradesh. The same time, 600 farmers in Punjab, which is one of the most fertile areas called the Granary of India, they also committed suicide. An Indian journalist, P. Sainath, he visited all the police stations in Anantpur, and he reported that out of 1,600 of those uh, 2,000 farmers, they were committed by drinking pesticides, and that most of the farmers had failed and defaulted on paying their, uh, making their loan payments to the bank. With this industrial agriculture, as farmers have been put on the treadmill of you know, chemical-intensive agriculture, it has increased the cost of production. At the same time, there are no markets, leaving uh, farmers with a dead end, and when they're faced with a dead end, they have opted for death. It is estimated that between 97 and 2000, over 20,000 farmers in India have committed suicide. This is a country which, according to the government of India, every year, two million farmers are displaced from land. When I say displaced, it means people who lose their land, they're the ones who migrate to Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta. You can go to villages in the south of India where you won't find a single young man between the age of 18 and 35 with both kidneys because they've sold a body part, they've sold a kidney to make ends meet. And the sad thing is, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN says that in the developing world, there are about 815 million people, 815, who are food insecure, and India is home to 380 million of them. India is also the third largest producer of food in the world. It is not because of population that people are committing suicide and there's not enough to eat and there are starvation deaths. In year 2000, while starvation deaths were being reported from across the country, the food granaries of the Food Corporation of India they were overflowing with almost 80,000 80, million tons of uh, excess food grain. Food that was rotting because Indian government was looking for export markets, could not find an export market because it could not compete with subsidized crops that come in from United States and Europe. So they were not buying from the farmers. Farmers were burning the crops in the field. Um, no way to pay back uh, the banks and the only way left was to take your life. So anyone who talks about hunger and says free trade agreements will increase national income and the national income will trickle down, or biotechnology or genetic engineering of food will increase food production, we know that will not solve hunger. Because people who are too poor to buy even two decent meals a day, there's no way they can buy two meals genetically engineered. Hunger cannot be solved by a technological fix or by free trade solution. For dealing with hunger, we need living wage jobs, for example, in a country like the United States. We need um, land reform. We need real agrarian reform that we can ensure people's access and control over food producing resources. But I have some good news. And the good news is that any system which is built on structural inequities is ultimately unsustainable. It fuels conflict and struggle along the lines of class, gender, ethnicity till it consumes itself, and today's modern industrial agriculture is just such a system. It is unsustainable and bound to fail. Mexico was once self-sufficient in grains, but now largely, as a result of NAFTA, it imports, it is estimated, 95% of soy, 58% of rice, 49% of wheat, and 40% of its meat. NAFTA is killing the Mexican countryside with an estimated 600 peasants being displaced from land each day. Where do these farmers go? They try to come to America, they try to cross the border only to find death at the border or incarceration at the border or slavery in the fields of America. In January 2003, Mexican farm leaders under a united front 
called Countryside Cannot Take It Anymore, they started a hunger strike to protest the agricultural chapters of NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. The hunger strike was accompanied by demonstrations along the U.S.-Mexican border, at airports, on highways, at the offices of the transnational agribusinesses, and farmers in Mexico saw an outpouring of support for their struggle both within the country and internationally. And this cross-border organizing is the new face of agriculture. It was present in Cancun, what Kristen was ref referring to. Uh, in September 2004, the fifth ministerial of the World Trade Organization was held in this uh, holiday resort of Cancun in Mexico. And while the trade ministers and corporations were meeting inside the convention center to bring the trade barriers down by erecting barriers to keep over 15,000 indigenous folk, farmers, and youth out who were protesting the World Trade Organization. On September 10th, Lee Keng He, leader of the Korean Federation of Advanced Farmers Association, he climbed up the barricades. He was wearing a sandwich board that read, WTO kills farmers and Lee King He took his own life with a knife to his heart. Lee had watched over the years hundreds of his fellow farmers and active, um, activists in the Federation being driven off their lands. He himself lost his farm about four years ago. His life was dedicated to the Korean countryside and to the struggles globally. And his death and his suicide was a wake-up call for the trade ministers who were meeting inside the convention center that WTO is killing farmers, that the farmers around the world do not want trade in agriculture. As I share Lee's story with you, which is not very easy uh, for people like Kristen and many others who have worked with the farmers, I share this because I don't want to think that the new face of agriculture is without hope. The farmers around the world, the stewards of a land and keepers of nature's inheritance to humanity, they have been walking this path forever without thinking about hopelessness. I've had the honor of working with farmers around the world, including the United States. And when I look at them, they do not seem to be hopeless. And they say that they have not quit, despite the census saying that there is no professional category of farmers in the United States. And they have not quit because they're not hopeless. They question and they challenge when they're told that industrial food is cheap, that who will factor in the price of the loss of rural communities, the loss of our farmers, the loss of our land, and the tragedies in each one of these families. I have never had the privilege of working on a farm, but I come from a country which is basically an agrarian economy, a land rich of farmers, rich biodiversity, and in my copious free time, I actually grow vegetables in my yard. And I made the decision to keep on in this fight by looking for reasons to keep on. And I want to share those reasons with you today. Well, I think Kristen would agree with me here and any of you who are involved in agriculture that we cannot overemphasize that today the organic food movement is the fastest growing sector in US agriculture. It is a multi-billion dollar industry with tens of thousands of farmers involved. And there is a really good market for organic vegetables, organic meat, pasture-raised chickens, which are sold at a premium to local customers. The challenge is with supermarkets like Safeway and others have seen that there is a market and they have started taking over the movement that was started by the farmers. So our challenge is to take it back to our farmers who have been taking care of the land and growing food organically. Rural communities are fighting back. Just two weeks ago, I was in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania has about 60,000 farmers, and um, they have a very unique system of democracy with lots of municipal governments. And they have been working, inspired by struggles in South Dakota, to implement anti-corporate farming laws, and which is preventing factory farms from being sited um, in their rural communities. Urban agriculture is a growing phenomena around the world, and in some cases, like Cuba, it is so big that urban gardens inside Havana are no longer, longer called urban gardens. It is called urban agriculture. All over America, a vibrant and a just food system is growing. It consists of family farm groups, community gardeners, nutritionists, environmentalists, which is working to ensure community food security. And the result of that has been farmers' markets 
that have grown from about 1,700 to over 3,000 in the last 10 years. At the same time, you have community-supported agriculture or subscription farms which are helping us form a direct relationship with our food producers. You have New York, which lost about 1 million acres of fertile farmland between 1987 and 97, displacing family farmers and threatening the future of its dairy farms. And it has just food, which is connecting urban families with farmers. The city of Boston is very proud of its inner city food project, which is growing over 200,000 pounds of organically grown food from a 21-acre farm and three city farm lots in Boston. 55% of this food is donated to 15 homeless shelters. 5% is sold at reasonable rates at inner city farmers markets. And the remaining 40% goes to feed 225 uh, CSA family shareholders. And Food First, where I work, is based in Oakland. And we are very proud that right in Oakland, in West Oakland, which is the inner city area, it is home to People's Grocery, which is a community garden and mobile market in the heart of West Oakland. A 4,000 square foot vacant lot has been converted into a community garden that grows seasonal fruits and vegetables. And its mobile market, which is a bus which runs on biodiesel, it sells fresh produce and, um, in farmers markets. You have nationwide student parents, teachers, and school administrators coming together to, for farm to school programs where local farmers supply schools with nutritious food. This started with uh, Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District in 97, and today over 700 school districts participate in this program, which has even spread to the universities and other public institutions, such as Connecticut Department of Corrections. The new face of agriculture has the coalition of Immokalee workers. Immokalee is a small town in Florida, and it, given the climate and the soil, it is great for growing tomatoes. So, for example, Taco Bell, uh, contracts out this tomato growing in Imakli. And these farm workers are what used to be farmers from Haiti, Guatemala, and Mexico. Displaced from their land, they have come to Imakli. They haven't had a wage increase in over 20 years. They are paid 35 cents for a 40-pound uh, uh, bucket of tomatoes. There have been instances where they have reported that there were farmer, farm workers who were working six days a week 13, 14 hours a day and being paid $20 a week. That is called slavery in the fields. This coalition of Imakli workers is not willing to settle for any more injustice. Uh, March 2nd, they're going to start a march in East LA. They're going to march down for 45 miles or so to Taco Bell headquarters in Irvine. And there'll be a big rally on the 5th of March. If you go to our website at www.foodfirst.org, you will see how Food First is involved in that rally. Uh, we are the staff of Food First will be marching with the farm workers and going to the rally outside Taco Bell headquarters. The demand is to increase their wages by one penny. Even if they increase the wages by one penny per tomato, it will make a big impact in the lives of the farm workers, and Taco Bell refuses to do that. But they're not just fighting. Immokalee workers, have been recognized, and they were given the Human Rights Award last year by um, uh, RF uh, Kennedy um, Human Rights Award last December. In September, the international issue of National Geographic, the cover story was that of Immokalee workers. And of course, the US issue, the cover story was that of zebras. <laughs> there is Mendocino County. Just last weekend, I was in Mendocino the, on March 2nd, on the election day. They're trying to pass Measure H that would make, if passed, Mendocino the first county in the United States to ban the cultivation of GM crops in the county. It is a community effort while the industry has poured in $500,000 to stop that Measure H from happening. They do not even have a TV station, but the industry is running TV ads in other places about Measure H. The biggest argument that the industry is putting out is that Measure H will take away the privacy of people because federal authorities and state authorities and municipal authorities can come in and look in your backyard if you're growing GM crops. With a constitutional amendment, these government authorities need to have a warrant. But what Monsanto does when it senses detectives into the farms of farmers, 
They don't even have a warrant. They are terrorizing our farmers. So the county of Mendocino has come together to fight back the biotech corporations and Vermont is trying to do the same. And it is incredible that they are doing it because just in the last two years, Zambia, which was facing starvation, when it asked for international help, U.S. tried to f force GM food aid on Zambia. And it wasn't free food aid. It was a loan of $51 million given to a private agency which had to be used to buy GM corn from the United States. And when they refused, it was like a mouse that roared. Tony Hall, a uh, representative to the food agencies of the UN, he said Zambia should be tried before the International Criminal Court for starving its people. Somebody needs to tell him U.S. doesn't believe in the International Criminal Court. <laughs> India last year was again told to accept GM food aid. And the same thing happened. India said no to GM food aid from the United States because this food aid is a way of subsidizing agribusiness because the Europeans don't want that food. And the agribusinesses in America do not get this, that food that is not good for Europeans is also not good for Asians, Africans, and Latin Americans. That actually when Bush blames Europeans for uh, keeping third world away from GM food, he doesn't realize that the third world can actually think for itself. There is Australia, which state after state has been adopting moratoriums around GE crops. Last year I was in Victoria, which was Greenpeace was very active in getting a moratorium on the planting of GE canola, and they were successful in that. And of course, there's Europe, which has been fighting back the challenge from uh, United States and the World Trade Organization that regulation of GM crops is a trade barrier, that protecting our environment, protecting our communities, protecting our farmers is seen as a trade barrier. There is MST, Movement of Landless Workers in Brazil. Uh, Brazil, a rich country, at the same time, which sees 40,000 people die each year from hunger-related diseases. And the movement of landless workers, despite the brutalization that happens at the hands of uh, private armies of rich landlords, have been occupying lands. They have settled over 250,000 families, which provides a roof over the heads of children and families and food on the table. There's a black farmers movement in the United States. Um, at the start of the 20th century, there were a million black farmers. By the end of the century, only 10,000 were left. Black farmers in the U.S. are like the canary in the mine shaft of American agriculture. Systematic discrimination by USDA, which did not give loans to black farmers, has seen their farms foreclose and displacement from land. And then this June, Bio, which is the consortium of the biotech trade industry, has decided to come to San Francisco. They're really stupid. They're coming to the Bay Area for the annual meeting. And there is a growing movement which is bringing together people who have challenged war to people who are challenging genetic engineering of a food system, people who are looking at human genetics. They're coming together as a welcome party to host the welcome party for the industry when it meets in San Francisco. It is the first weekend of June. I invite you all. Come join the party. Each of these examples that I've mentioned, they're not merely isolated examples of struggle alternatives that is taking place. They're really about change that is taking place on the ground, slowly, organically, steadily. And I would say it's best crop is a new consciousness where we realize that food is both personal and political. Food is personal because each one of us, never mind our race, the color of our skin, our age, whatever, we all need it. It is personal, it goes right inside us. And it is political because every time we reach out on the market shelf and grab something from the market shelf, we are making a decision. A decision which shows how food is grown, who grows it, who gets to eat it. And it is also what Andy Kimbrell, another of my inspirations, who says, is transforming us from being consumers to a creator. Being a consumer, I mean, if you think about it, fire consumes, tuberculosis consumes. But the decision that we make is helping us become creators because it is helping us transform the industrial food system to us creating a food system which is more life-sustaining and just. And the battle cry of this new face of agriculture is food sovereignty. Um, if it is not already obvious what it is, I would 
just describe how Via Campesina, which is the world's largest small farmers movement, describes it to be. Food sovereignty prioritizes local, regional, and national needs based on agriculture that consists of small farmers, fisher folk, and other local communities. It is about protecting local and national markets of basic foodstuffs to give priority to the products of local farmers. It is about promoting, protecting, and enforcing farmers' rights, rights to seeds, to water, to land. It is about promoting sustainable peasant agriculture, which is more productive. Research done at Food First shows that small farms are far more productive than the large industrial farms. It is about promoting a direct and shared and decentralized relationship between food producers and the rest of the community. It is about ensuring genuine agrarian reform and land reform where even women, like in my country, India, have title to the land. More important, it is about creating a new farm economy which should be the centerpiece of country's economic development model. I'm going to close with uh, something from Gita. I was born a Hindu, and Gita is basically the philosophy of Hinduism. In the midst of battle, when the stakes were so clear, Krishna, the charioteer, talked to Arjun, the fighter, in the battlefield, because Arjun suddenly had this dilemma that he cannot fight this war. And Krishna told him, your very nature will drive you to fight. The only choice is what to fight against. And I don't mean to impose my Hinduism on you, but I think each one of us is confronted with that. We are all fighters by nature. And we have to decide what we're going to fight against. And the fact that you are here on a cold evening, I would reckon, if you're not here for your credits, that you are fighters. That's why you're here. Our choice is going to help create a new future, a different future. And that is the new face of agriculture and sustaining it, which I describe. And a lot of people say, and especially, I'm sure Kristen, you faced this too, you know, you stand up before the WTO, I've been told, this is beautiful, and rather you're so passionate about your issues, but dear, it is just not really possible. You know, it is not feasible. You know, in Geneva and in Washington, D.C., always told, but it is just not feasible. And I have to always remind them that the women's movement was told that the right to vote was not a feasible idea. That the civil rights movement was told <clears throat> that end of discrimination was not going to really happen. A good idea, but it, this time has not yet come. And I'll end by sharing um, what my favorite Sufi poet Hafiz said about fear. Fear is the cheapest room in the house. My dear, you deserve better living conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, in Seattle, we saw an incredible success. Um, they were not prepared for the kind of uh, protests that took place. They were not prepared for the fact that the, you know, these young students who so and others who believed in social economic justice for all would chain themselves to the hotel doors, not letting the delegates go to the meetings. And they have learned from that. We have seen increased brutalization. We have seen criminalization of dissent. We have seen in Miami what happened, uh, you know, breach of our basic rights. Uh, we saw in Cancun how the protesters were kept at least 10 kilometers away from the convention center, that they talk about freedom and free trade by creating a police state. So in terms of where do we go next, we also can learn from Cancun where we saw the inside-outside strategy work really, really well. Cancun just did not happen overnight. For example, IATP had their staff in Geneva. Some other groups had their staff in Geneva who were sending updates as to what was happening in Geneva, what was being planned. That information then would kind of trickle down to national capitals, from capitals to every town village or where people are mobilizing. And what it really comes down to is that we need, on one hand, strong national mobilizations, where government of Brazil, where government of India knows that it cannot go to a meeting and sell out its people and the farmers, that it would be held accountable when it comes back, that the democracy is happening in every country where the demands of the people are clear on, on the, clearly on the agenda of the decision makers. And of course, we need a lot of momentum and struggle right here in the United States. We need the struggle in the belly of the beast. That we need to get it very clear 
to our congressional representatives and senators that free trade agreements have created a global south and a global north, that they're hurting farmers, that they're hurting working poor around the world in similar ways. Uh, just today in USA Today, I was showing Brett that there was an editorial, uh, not that I respect USA Today much, but there was an editorial which talked about, compared to 99, how in the United States today the, the support for free trade agreements has declined. Because not just the blue-collared workers, but even the white-collared workers are beginning to see that they're losing their jobs. And these jobs are not beneficial to third world countries. Mexico has lost jobs too. It is a race to the bottom. So that kind of cross-border organizing and keeping the momentum up right here in the United States, it sends a very important message to the rest of the world that they're not isolated in their struggles. The people of the United States do not want free trade agreements which are about creating slavery everywhere. That did, for example, Vermont and Mendocino are so important for the GE ban because that's what's happening around the world and U.S. is the big bully saying, what we can eat, you can eat too. So if Mendocino was saying, hey, we banned it, other countries can say, look, if you banned it, we want to ban it too. So in terms of what's happening next, the pressure has to go on uh, and we have to continue putting a lot of pressure. Cancun was a big victory because third world countries, despite all the arm twisting tactics of Europe and United States, despite the arrogance of Zolik, United States trade representative did not buckle under the pressure. So it marked a huge big difference in international geopolitics. However, we still have to work to put the agenda of small farmers, food sovereignty on the agenda of these G20 or these nations that came together to stand up to the United States and Europe. And the only way we can continue to do that is by building international coalitions, by you know, sharing information, and, uh, and keeping the highlight on the brutality of the police because we cannot allow criminalization of dissent. So this is about linking our economic, social, cultural, human rights with the basic civil and political rights. When people went to Cancun, <clears throat> there were lots of differences. For example, Europe and America, who hadn't been getting along too well, they put forward an agricultural proposal that was the most contentious issue because third world countries were saying, hey, agriculture was the carrot that was given to us to join the World Trade Organization, which then became a stick, as we are seeing our markets are being taken over. So they came forward with their own proposal but the proposal that was put forward for Cancun talks basically was the U.S.-Europe proposal completely ignoring the demands of the third world country. So agriculture was a contentious issue. And G20 did come together. As I said, their agenda was that of their food exporting countries. They can export. They wanted more market access. It was not about saying no to trade agreements. It was about more market access. And then there were other countries that came together that were saying we want to put aside special products that they should not be in free trade agreements. And if you added up all their products, then you would have basically trade in agriculture stopped. So the focus became on G20. But the real reason the talks collapsed, because the contentious, contentious issue was agriculture, was Europe started talking about the new issues. They wanted to bring in new issues to talk about. And these countries were like, hey, wait a minute. We haven't resolved agriculture, how can we talk about the new issues? So that is when the pressure went on and the countries like, it wasn't actually G20, Brazil or India who walked out of the talks. It was Kenya, ACP, the African Caribbean Pacific nations, they said, you know, these are not going anywhere and they walked out. So it was a very complex phenomena of different countries because they were not isolated, that they could come together and support each other, which they could not do in Doha. You did not have that support mechanism. It was right after September 11th. Uh, countries could be threatened with um, that the aid would be cut off. Pakistan, that we might make a stop in Pakistan on the way to Afghanistan. So there were all those different factors. So it is really about countries coming together. And I agree with you. G20, as I said, we need to respect that it is great that they could stick together and not get divided. But we have to work to put the agenda of small farmers on their agenda because they're still just talking about subsidies. Elections in America are really important for the rest of the world, and I guess I don't need to tell you why. Um, the rest of the world is demanding that we don't want to deal with an empire, whether it's a kinder empire, 
or an empire the kind we have seen under the Bush administration. So given that, I think we have to go beyond thinking that anyone but Bush. We have to also put our issues on the agenda of John Kerry. If you look at his record of the number of years he has spent um, as an elected official and how many bills he has passed, three, 18 years and three legislations. So I think it is going to be really important to convey the message to the Democrats that the way they can win elections is not by staying in the center or moving towards the right of the center. The choice is very clear to move to the left of the center. That the real issues of economy, economy is hurting, education uh, budgets are being slashed around the country. That this is about our future. It is not just, no longer just talking about someone else or what happens in Iraq or Afghanistan. There's a war right here at home. The kind of cuts that we have seen in our social safety net, in our all kind of school programs. What we have at best is No Child Left Behind Education Act, which basically allows military uh, personnel to go into high schools. Kids who can't buy alcohol, uh, can't buy cigarettes, can be enrolled for to be sent off to a boot camp. So I think it is really about letting Kerry know that it's not just about making promises or sounding that he's in the center, but really putting our progressive values. And that is a challenge before each one of us in this year. In terms of Kucinich, I've been telling all my friends in California to vote for Kucinich just to get a message to Kerry that you know it's not all ready for him. Um, it's very important to get those debates going. In terms of trade, first of all, uh, in a class that I was meeting earlier and I shared it with them. People just call us being against trade, anti-globalization. We are not anti-globalization. I define our movement as that of pro-democracy, pro-human rights, pro-women's rights, pro-immigrant rights, pro-environment. We are the ones who are pro-everything good in life. And they are the ones who are anti-everything good in life. So we are creating a different kind of globalization, globalization from below. So in terms of the trade agreements, Trade has always existed. It is not new. But it is about what kind of trade do we want. And we have to listen to the people who are directly impacted, for example. For example, the farmers movement say trade agreements out of agriculture. Agriculture is about feeding of families and communities. It is not about trading global commerce in commodities. It is about the multifunctionality of agriculture, the role it plays in maintaining our environment, our biodiversity. And given that, trade agreements cannot supersede everything. We have our human rights governance and conventions. That those come first before a treaty in trade. And um, so that would be our message that when we know the evidence is in, in terms of NAFTA, it has been a disaster for all three countries. So we have to listen to the demand of social movements when they say no to FTAA, Free Trade Area of the Americas. In terms of WTO, when the evidence is in, in terms of job loss around the world, when the evidence is in, in terms of the increasing powers of corporations who have uh, real rights compared to human beings. So looking at that evidence, it is not just about being rhetorical, that it means that those trade agreements have not served the purpose that they said they were going to serve, so they need to go. Great question. Uh, is that C word? Uh, <laughs> um, it is definitely about how our economy is organized, and it is about the economics and the school of economics that is running it, um, and the way the capitalist systems of economics is organized. It will benefit a certain class. That and and with that, I would say, sexism, racism, all plays into that. It is not separate. I would go beyond how Marx would have said, because I don't think we can solve the problem by just transferring over um, our, 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 you know, our manufacturing units to the proletariat. Because I don't know if you really want workers in charge of nuclear plants or in charge of uh, you know, Monsanto's. We want to get rid of them altogether. And train as a political economist. I want to go beyond those theories to be able to see that we do have a system which caters, which is set up by certain people, which is caters to the interest of those people. And it is pretty obvious, and that is how the capitalist system of economics will always work, and it always has. Things are not hopeless. The power is really within us. We make 
our decisions and those decisions have a huge big impact as students who pay tuition fees, as teachers, as community that contributes to this campus, you can have a huge big say in terms of who provides food to, to the college campus. There are amazing examples, and I'm quite sure IATP could link up, and there are all other places that could link you up with CSAs and other places which can bring in locally grown, organically grown, uh, food which would support our farmers, farmers, local farmers. This is about local economies. Nobody else can do it for you. It is as students, as teachers, as a community that is invested in this college campus to be able to say we demand. It is a basic right to be able to demand where the food comes from, where it is grown, who benefits from it. This is what democracy looks like. I mean one thing I've learned in my time in the United States since 95 is I've learned lots about democracy from this country in every way possible. And it is really up to the people to make it that it is the institutions, whether they are college campuses, whether they are uh, you know, Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., that they represent interests of the people, they are run by the people, and they are for the people. That is a simple definition of democracy. Coming back to the issue of cheap food, I think it is really about education, and that's what I was hoping to be able to do to question. When we talk about cheap food, what that food is, for example, when we pay 99 cents for a loaf of bread, how much of it really goes to the farmer? You know, questioning that, how many of us know that if you, you know, spend a dollar on a loaf of bread, how much of it goes to the farmer? Four. Where is the rest of, and Daniel always knows everything. Um, and um, how much does it cost the farmer to, uh, that wheat that goes into, how much does it cost the farmer? Do you know that, Daniel? Okay, he's not that smart. He would have said more than four cents. <laughs> so that is what we have to question, that when our farmers are not even being paid, the amount that it takes them to grow their food, we have to question as a society who makes the money on it. And it then that's when it comes down to the corporate control of a food system where a handful of corporations who are horizontally, vertically, you know, all integrated, they control everything and they're the ones who are making the profit. So it is really about changing the food system and questioning that. And it is about then questioning also what the real cost is when we buy something cheap in the, you know what did it include the cost of polluting the environment polluting the groundwater polluting the air what happens to the farm workers and once we start making those choices which i did actually i discovered it's not that i was spending more money because suddenly i was going to the farmers market every weekend first of all it was a whole community that i missed that i left behind in india i've come to know all the farmers at the jack london square who come there who share their recipes um, as I've gotten to know them, when I ask for a pound of tomatoes, I walk away with a pound and a half. And um, it is really looking at the cost when I started you know, calculating for myself. I, well, the most beautiful thing about this new phase of agriculture is that it is no longer just for the yuppies. As I mentioned, as more and more farmers markets are moving to the inner city areas, they're accepting food stamps, they're accepting WIC coupons. The food is not that expensive and we continuously believe because the industry has been telling us that the food is more expensive if we buy it organic, if they don't produce for us. Because they have a vested interest in it and that is they need those profit margins for themselves. And forming a direct relationship with the farmers over and over again has shown that actually the cost of food does go down. It is going to take a lot of education and that's why groups like IATP, like Food First and others become really important to keep getting the message out there that the food that they're selling is really expensive. It is basically, I would say this, would you go and buy a landmine if it is cheap? Then why are you placing those landmines in your stomach? When we talk about a global movement, it is not just one single organization that is just growing in size. It is a very diverse movement which is inspired by each other. Some people say it started in Seattle. Some people say, no, it started in 94 when the Zapatistas came down. 
Some people say it started hundreds and hundreds of years ago, right here in the Americas, when uh, you know the fight started against uh, against slavery. Some people say the struggle has been ongoing. It has been a struggle against colonization. It has taken different forms. It does not aim to have one vision. We do not want to be like World Bank and IMF, that one shoe size fits all. We don't want that. It has different vision, and it has been articulated by the social movements at the World Social Forum as a better world is possible. And that better is being defined by communities in different ways. Whether it has been in Venezuela, uh, where communities have fought for democracy that rather than just get rid of a president, good or bad, I'm not going into that, but the fact that there needs to be some kind of a process, democracy looks different, or whether it was in Brazil, eighth largest economy, despite a lot of pressure that they were able to elect a former you know, steel factory worker as the president, or whether it has been in Bolivia. So those changes are taking place. Sometimes they're at the grassroots level, fighting against the privatization of water in Bolivia, or they can take the shape of a national political movement, electing their different kind of president, or whether it is about what kind of trade agreements they form, but there is not one unified vision other than that we are all struggling for a better world, a better world where all human beings can say, have a life of dignity, can lead a life with human dignity, and their human rights are ensured. In terms of challenges, I think we always have to try because in the United States, for example, I feel still we have to ensure that the groups that are grappling with poverty issues, hunger issues, uh, homelessness issues right here in the US, they need to be brought in more into the debate around free trade because sometimes free trade tends to happen you know, with people like from me, from Food First, you know, articulating it. We need to do more of that. We're beginning to see it as Coalition of Immokalee Workers was very active in Miami, in Florida, at the meeting of the Free Trade Area of the Americas. And we have to make sure that the struggles that are taking place at the local level, for example, the water struggle in Bolivia, the kind of international stature it obtained, for example, the struggle against the Narbada Dam in India, internationally it is known, we have to make sure that those local struggles gain momentum, that they're seen on the international stage and international support is built for them.